This sermon this morning is titled, Kiss the Sun. I don't like to make it a habit of preaching outside the walls of the church. It is too easy as a Christian to point out all the shortcomings of those outside the family of faith. But every now and again, you do have to go there. The scripture today, I think, makes it very apparent that the son is rejected, at least in Psalm 2, it said, by the kings of the earth and around the various governments and powers that be. And as we have learned in our days, there are businesses that are every bit as powerful as nations, and that's who is cautioned to not reject the son. You may be aware in this age when we're trying to be so peace, love, and Bobby Sherman. <laughs> My wife knew that was coming. I always put those three together as my version of unicorns and rainbows. But in this age where we, well, let, let me just say it, in the chaplain corps, you know, I'm, I'm a Navy chaplain as well, and they try and get us to celebrate that all faiths are alike, you know, to get all excited that we have all these various religions in the chaplain corps. And I realized that the very reason I get to, you know, I, we've all heard of the separation of church and state, so what is the government doing providing and paying for chaplains? And that is because as Americans, we have a constitutional right to practice our faith. And because the government, when you're in uniform, says you must be here on such and such a date at such and such a time, and often that is Sunday at church or whenever your, na your religion's faith says to worship your God, because we take that away with one hand, we give it back with the other. That's the, 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 the rationale for why it doesn't violate the separation of church and state to provide Navy chap or chaplains in all the branches. Because what the government takes away with one hand, this is one instance where the government gives back with the other. Okay, um, <laughs> I'm so political today. Um, but that is, ironically, the essence of what Psalm 2 was talking about. You know, I, I'm hopefully not going to get partisan too much, um, but this recognition that as we're in the middle of this season where we celebrate the son being born, that son is a direct threat to governments. And that's what Psalm 2 is talking about. If you remember last week when we were looking at, um, you know, being born, uh, that was in Revelations 12, Psalm 2 was quoted there too. So you get this second Psalm it, quoted at the, at, the, at the book that ends the Bible. You can't get away from Psalm 2 and the Son and his threat to those in power and we see it so explicitly. I, I know you wondered, wasn't he just talking about the Navy Chaplain Corps? That's because we have Muslim chaplains. It's God's test of my patience. Glenn will tell you, whenever I get ready to do, if I have to do a three-point turn, a car, it doesn't matter what time of the night and how desolate. I could be in the most desolate place in the brush country on a dirt road, but if I had to do a three-point turn, there would instantly be a car behind me. And Glenda has, yesterday was our 39th wedding anniversary. I know, it shows she has a lot of patience to put up with me for 39 years. But in 39 years, how many times have you seen that happen? Every time. You know, I could have been rescued off Gilligan's Island if I had just done a three-point turn because somebody would have appeared. You have to be old enough to remember Gilligan's Island. But anyhow, God has certain things where he likes to test me. And right now, I have two Muslim chaplains working for me. Probably more Muslim chaplains working for me than any other chaplain in the Navy. 
And I have to remind myself that they are an extension of the very same thing that gives me access to sailors, gives them access, that, that there are sailors that serve us. And, um, and I'm definitely not calling into question their patriotism. We, we could not have fought in Iraq and Afghanistan without Muslims on our side. So don't hear that. Because they definitely, there were nights I slept in peace because Muslims were standing to watch. So I'm not putting them down as people. But their truth claims are radically opposed to the sun. It says several times in the Quran about how God has no son. He has no need to have a son. So anyone who tells you that the Muslims worship the same God we do is, is telling you a lie. Because they're, it's, it's so central that on the Dome of the Rock, they have this carved kind of like over the door as you go out. As you, after you've come in there and done your prayers, remember, God has no son. As you, as you walk out and into the kind of Christian world, this son is a threat to many, many ideologies and powers and religions. And yet, Psalm 2 said very clearly, kiss the son. Kiss the son. Think about that a moment. And remember, even to our Jewish friends, this is not their understanding of God either. That's why if you read a Jewish, an English translation of Psalm 2 by a Jewish editor, they will not have kissed the sun in that verse of Psalm 2. They will say, well, serve the Lord with fear and trembling, and then it just kind of jumps over, and there's no mention of the sun in Psalm 2 because it is, well, they say somehow the Christians snuck that in there on them. <laughs> I don't know how we snuck it in there a thousand years before Christ was born, but somehow we got in there and changed it and put kiss the sun in there. There is only one religion that where God has a son. It's ours. So outside these walls, that is a revolutionary idea. But what do the people who bear the name of the son, how, how could that serve us today? What, what could we get out of that? Well, it helps a little bit if we look at why do the nations rage and the people conspire against the Lord and against his anointed one, which that anointed one, same word we say Messiah or against his Christ. Why does it challenge them so much? And then maybe we look and see if it challenges us in the same way. In our fractured society that we're in right now, uh, you know, family-wise. Glenda and I, it's kind of funny, you know, that say, well, 39 years of marriage, that's, m for many of our friends, they aren't anywhere near that. You know, that's, oh, man, it took us five marriages to get to 39 years, you know? And, and, and so that means that our families, and, and, and trust me, the bachelor families, that way even our children, you know, with a name like bachelor, people say, are you still a bachelor? And every generation of bachelor has to come up with a joke about their name so that they can kind of deflect these silly questions about the name bachelor. My dad's thing, you know, he, dad's a little older from a different generation. When people say to him, um, are you really a bachelor? And he would answer, and my mother was a bachelor too. And in 1930, if your mother was a bachelor, that was a problem. <laughs> and so um, now I say, um, or or uh, sometimes they say, are you married, you're Mr. Bachelor? And I'll say, well, even my kids have been married at least once, you know. So, you know, we have to acknowledge that, that even though we thought we demonstrated a pretty good model, our kids have chosen another model. Families are fractured, and that means inheritance are fractured. And last week I was in Louisiana because my mom was saying goodbye to Louisiana. She's 85, she can't drive anymore, and she goes, I wanna go out there one more time before I die. She, she spent World War II in Louisiana. And she's got one cousin that's still alive. Anyhow, saying goodbye, but inheritance is a major part of that land in Louisiana. In 1921, one of her cousins died, and they fought over it and finally resolved it in 1978, when the last original inheritance person 
Well, when the last one was standing, you know, <laughs> 1921 to 1978, that's a long time to fight over an inheritance. People will do that. When you see the son being born into a family, when there, when there was, it looked like you were going to inherit it, and then there's a son, boom, you realize I'm not going to inherit. This is what goes on spiritually, I guess. That's why when God said, this is my son, and if you look at that second psalm, he says, now the earth is your inheritance, and, and ask me for it, and I'll give you everything. And, and it says, kind of harsh words, those who challenge your inheritance, you're going to get a piece of rebar, and you're going to bust them up like, like you know, a piece of clay pottery. That was pretty strong. But that's because now that the world thinks there's no chance that we are going to be the ones inheriting it goes through the sun, and the only way to get the kingdom of God and to get the universe is now this heir, this heir that bumped us out of the line of inheritance. We're mad, and a little feud like 1921 to 1978 is nothing. So that's what the world gets mad about, this birth of this son. Where, what kingdom, what piece of... God's inheritance did we think we had that we don't want this son, particularly this baby son. Do you guys like the graphics in, the, uh, in your bulletin today? <laughs> that baby with little lip marks all over him. Those of you who've, I, I know I reference Ricky Bobby about every third sermon, but I still look that with the guy saying, I want to pray to the baby Jesus. And I like the thought of the baby Jesus. Well, he's one of the few in Christendom that likes thinking about the baby Jesus. But today I want to take you to that baby place because sometimes we think we're so mature we don't need a God who came as a baby. We want the full-grown Jesus. We want, in, in some way, we want to kind of stack on that powerful Jesus and get behind him when in actual, actuality it starts when we can when we say kiss the sun and that's the sun that we're talking about kissing to say if god required this helpless state of his own son does that mean in my faith i've got to go back to that helpless place unless you have faith as a little child you've heard that line before that sort of thing, that, that helpless thing to say, oh, I wanted to be a grown-up my whole walk with Jesus. I'm, I've, I spent all the time reading the, uh, all the commentaries, and, and I've Googled this passage a thousand times. I don't want to be a baby. Kiss the sun, lest he get angry with you. Something to challenge could we stay in Christmas all year long? I say this every week during Christmas season. I try not to go to Easter in Christmas. And I do it with a purpose, partly for myself, to keep remembering that this Christmas, this Advent, this stepping into human history as a little baby was very essential to Jesus's Role as the son. Said in Psalm 2, today I have become your father. Today you have become my son. These, this interchange of there was something even in Jesus' role as part of the Trinity that being a baby, this incarnation changed it all for him. And to take us back to last week's you know, use of Revelations 12, that's what the devil was ready to eat as the woman who was in labor. It was to catch that baby. It wasn't coming for a grown man. It was coming for the baby. And as we struggle in our faith, sometimes we get too grown up. Sometimes we can't kiss the baby. But let's face it, there are things about our walk that we can't perfectly explain. We think we need to go more mature when in actual fact we've got to come back to the baby thing and say, 
I will never understand this. I must accept it as a child on faith because it's written right here. That's, that is enough. As a baby, I accept it. You know, ba- think of all the things babies accept. Well, they, they expect you to do everything for them, right? We sometimes grow up so much that we no longer, we say, well, God, you know, if I get to an emergency, I'll come and pray. If, so and th- if bad things are happening over here, I'll come to you. But the rest of my life, I've got handled. I know all the answers. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be mature. And, if, you know, I, I don't think I've mentioned the bumper sticker too often, but when I was on staff in a Dallas church, I loved the youth pastor had a, a bumper sticker, but he pinned it to the door of his office, and it said, hire a teenager while they still know everything. And in a sense, that's us. And Jesus is like, come a little younger, come a little younger. John 5 told us some interesting things. said, as the Father can raise the dead and give them life, so too the Son gives life to whomever he chooses. I'm thinking about that. Wow. The Son has this prerogative of power, this ability to do exactly as his Father does. And going back to that earlier stage to say, some of us, we want the Father because his, you know, we get the Father through the Old Testament, through the law, through the 613 commandments of under Moses' teaching. We'll say, I'm, I'm pretty good. I've kept all of those. And Jesus encountered this too in his lifetime where he asked the, you know, the, the rich young ruler who came to him and he says, I've done all of those things that Moses commanded. That's amazing that anyone could say that, but I've heard people tell me I keep the Ten Commandments. Even if you narrow it down to ten, there's people who actually think they can keep the Ten Commandments. And I always point them back to, well, then read Matthew 5 again, and you will never think you kept the Ten Commandments. But in this case, it says the, in John 5, going back there, that the Son gives life to whomever he has. And if you don't, it then goes on to say, the Father judges no one. He has entrusted all care or all judgment to the Son so that, and here's the purpose to why the Son has all judgment, so nobody cuts the baby out of the loop. It says, if you do not respect the Son, you you can't possibly claim that you respect the Father because there are people, as I said, who, who want to just keep it on the old covenant, who want to cut the new covenant out. And, and the much tougher teachings of Matthew 5 over Exodus 20. It's easier there. This son, this baby complicates things for us in our walk. Well, I've probably put enough different things to consider for us there. To try and keep us in the moment. To stay present in Advent to maybe simplify if our life has been too complicated to come back to say, you know, the Lord is right. There's things I have to accept as a little child that I will never be able to get this to understand. So I just have to let this believe. And then when I do that, in a sense, I've kissed the baby. I've kissed the son. Let us pray. Lord, We know that outside the church, the nations rage, people conspire, but Lord, it shouldn't be that way inside the church. Lord, let us get our plan lined up with your plan, and your plan was so simple that you put away all dignity, and you came and were born in a manger and walked among us. Thank you, Emmanuel. It's in your name we pray. Amen.